How are you doing this Martin from Guidance for Life? So uh, this is the first of the um, questions and answers um, sessions that we're going to post up where we ask our audience or you guys um, if you have any questions about a certain topic uh, and we'll try our best to answer them um, with our experience or what with what experience we've gathered over the last few years anyway and um, luckily now the last time uh, we got uh, over the last week we've actually received about 25 to 30 questions so it's quite a number of questions some of them are a little similar so I'll try not to repeat myself but the important thing is that um, we'll uh, we'll try and address them all and uh, we'll try and answer them as well as we can and we have split it up into topics simply because these sessions would be too long if it was very general today's session is about um, uh, no dig mulch gardening and um, what kind of benefits you can have from it. I'd like to start with uh, saying um, well, thanks to all the people that have actually asked questions and posted them up and we're going to um, go through them in a minute. Well, so I thought I might say um, that I'm actually indoors because um, it's uh, raining outside at the moment and I finally actually get a chance to do this video um, because normally once there is a bit of daylight out there and it's not raining I'm basically out there in the garden or around the house or the yard getting some work done that requires you know no rain and um, I just want to show you I'm just in uh, my wife's uh, lovely studio um, in a birdland studio I'll just show you I were in the middle of the forest here look in our little fifth of an acre forest on our own uh, land beside our house and um, I've even also got the mother here, that's her name, because she had kittens a long time ago. Now, she looks after the garden. Okay, so what I'll do is, um, sorry this chair is awful squeaky, um, what I'll do is, um, I'm just going to um, quickly run through some of the topics that I actually came up with. Uh, so no dig mulch gardening is today's topic anyway. And I have the laptop just under the camera, so I'm hopefully not looking too far away from the camera um, to read these questions and everything. And um, so I'm going to um, just run through them here. So we came up with a few more topics for these questions and answers uh, sessions. Uh, one of them is um, growing fruits, berries and vegetables in a no dig mulch garden. So you can ask us specifically questions about the plants themselves. And we have another one uh, coming up soon. Uh, the plant nursery, starting plants, uh, plant propagation, repotting and planting them out and um, so that will be a very interesting one. We did two workshops last year as well in that with volunteers and we got a lot of work done but at the same time uh, the volunteers have learned um, the propagation methods and they can all they all have the tools to grow their own plants now so um, that's great uh, homesteading is another one we might bring out at some point as a topic uh, that includes cooking, preserving, storing food and medicinal herbs and brewing like country wines and that kind of thing and um, basically using the produce from your garden in your kitchen bringing the garden into your daily life as such and um, of course also preserving your summer produce or uh, during the things you get from the garden during the growing season and preserving basically even drying them and having them then in the winter time when there is nothing else around and um, another one another topic for questions and answers um, uh, session would be uh, plants uh, more specifically perennial plants um, it, with um, multiple uses and uh, basically food plants medicinal plants handcraft and building materials and uh, firewood even insectaries which means plants that attract beneficial insects to your garden so you don't have any pest outbreaks like uh, green fly and aphids and all that kind of thing and uh, wildlife plants of course as well um, plants that give the wildlife shelter and food uh, provides it with the things that it needs um, uh, nitrogen fixing plants like um, the uh, legumes like that that would be the locust trees and uh, the beans and peas and the lupins as well 
And uh, basically, any questions you have about plants, and uh, we'll announce these uh, one by one, and you can ask us questions um, when we announce them. So we'll, uh, we'll also send you an email if you're on our email list. Um, basically, if not, subscribe on our website, gardensforlife.ie forward slash subscribe. Enter your email address, and um, you will uh, be able to just reply to us as well in case you don't catch our Facebook page uh, or the post on our Facebook page or uh, any of the other social media posts. Um, you definitely get our email anyway. And uh, you often get a chance to enter um, a free raffle or giveaway raffles as well. So it's always worthwhile uh, being there and being the first to be informed about things that are going on uh, with Gardens for Life. So with that, we'll uh, get right into the questions. There's about 25 of them or so. So we'll try and keep them relatively short, the answers. Although I could go into tremendous detail on them. I could speak for 20 minutes probably about one of them. But um, the important thing is not to keep the video... Uh, I don't want to keep you too long. I don't want to make the video too long. Um, because I don't want to bore bore people either and um, hopefully um, we'll get through them all maybe under an hour or even a half an hour we'll see but um, and uh, hopefully everybody will be or some some of you will be able to use the information in your own gardens and uh, in your own the work that you do and uh, benefit from it as well and if you have any follow-up questions please do feel free to ask us anyway but if you, if these questions are related to uh, any of the topics that we are um, suggesting uh, for the upcoming uh, questions and answers sessions. Uh, just keep them until then and then ask us when the topic comes up, please, if you don't mind. So the most general question I actually put at the start, just because it sort of um, covers one or two of the other ones as well. And uh, Mary Fitzpatrick asked, um, uh, please explain um, no dig mulch gardening and what can you grow? Well, basically, no dig mulch gardening is just a way of um, mimicking nature and a forest floor. You're basically um, not digging up the soil, not uh, destroying the soil structure that nature has built and the soil life and the worms and the plants, in particular the taprooted plants have built over the last hundreds and thousands of years. And um, you keep the soil structure and that's really important. Uh, for drainage and for various other reasons for to have a healthy soil uh, you need soil structure and you are um, mulching the top of the soil as well but we like to do something called um, lasagna gardening where we also add in a layer of uh, uh, compost between the the woody mulch layer the wood is on top which is could be like wood chips or any other uh, car carbonous material so the wood chips go on top, for example, and you have the the um, uh, compost layer, which is uh, in between, uh, just under the mulch layer, and then you have the cardboard layer and the very bottom. And the cardboard's function is to basically smother the weeds, uh, so that you can actually uh, basically plant in that spot straight away. So you don't have to wait until um, um, the weeds are gone or you until you've smothered the weeds um, because the cardboard will actually z dissolve after a number of months depending on what kind of climate you live in here in Ireland it's quite wet and you um, it it only takes about three to six months for the cardboard layer to basically almost completely break up but after one year there isn't even uh, any of it left and uh, you're never going to be digging up that soil anyway so you're basically um, smothering the weeds and that carbon the carbon that comes from the cardboard is um, absorbed by the soil life and the plants so uh, ideally actually it's basically just composting it and actually giving back to nature rather than just dumping it and um, throwing it in a big pile um, in a landfill or somewhere like that where it won't dissolve because there's no soil there to actually dissolve it and um, so you have um, um, the other technique you have, oh, I'll get, I will get to that in a minute now. There's another question here that's kind of similar. So, no dig mulch gardening, you're basically not digging the soil and you are uh, layering on top of the existing soil structure. And um, uh, what can you grow in it? Uh, you can grow anything you would normally be able to grow in a conventional garden. Uh, we like to uh, 
grow annual vegetables, but mostly we try to grow perennial vegetables, such as all of the ancient tubers that we're growing and the, um, the likes of um, Egyptian onions and perennial leeks and uh, perennial kale, like Portuguese kale. Uh, sea kale, we haven't had much uh, um, success with just yet, but we will try again. Sea kale is actually from the coast of France, uh, northern France, I believe it is. And um, it is the original um, brassica plant. That's where all the broccolis that were bred from and all of the um, uh, cauliflowers and cabbages and everything else. So, um, um, yeah, so what can you grow? You can also grow berry bushes and you can grow um, culinary herbs uh, like um, or oregano, uh, thyme, uh, sage, um, all these plants absolutely love lasagna beds um, or no dig mulch beds and um, we like to try to keep the uh, herbs somewhat closer to the house if, we're, if we possibly can or the ones you want to access most often close to the paths so you don't have to step on the growing space so much and you can um, grow medicinal herbs of course Medicinal herbs are the most wonderful thing of them all because they save you an awful lot of money as well. You can grow things like Echinacea and make your own tincture uh, to boost your immune system, for example. Um, you can buy it in a pharmacy, but it's very expensive to buy the actual tincture. Um, you can um, grow all kinds of different um, uh, fruits, like fruit bushes, like we grow black currants, white and red currants, uh, gooseberries, we have goji berries, which haven't flowered yet, but we're growing a few different varieties to see which ones will fruit successfully outside. And um, um, oh, we have a whole, a whole array of different plants. We have pink, uh, pink blueberries. We shouldn't really call them blueberries then, I guess. Um, but uh, the uh, salmon berry is another one that we're actually propagating now. It is a lovely fruit and it has a lovely pink flower as well during the growing season, so it's quite ornamental. So there is a, a whole array of different plants that you can grow. The only disadvantage is really, and we'll get into that more later, that you can't, when, when you're using the, um, the mulch, when you're mulching the growing space with uh, wood chips, you can't use automatic seeders, um, like, you know, a wheel seeder that market gardeners would use. So you're best off to use uh, wood chips on the paths and uh, on the growing beds you can use just compost the same way as Charles Dowding would. And um, you can, uh, instead of the cardboard, if you have time, you can also smother the weeds using, um, you can smother the weeds using uh, black tarp or plastic basically. Um, during the summer months that's when I would do it uh, because that's when the grass is trying to grow and you can uh, smother, um, smother it within a space of maybe two or three months but it's best to keep it on as long as you possibly can if even possible half a year just to make sure that you get rid of all of the perennial weeds as well along with the grasses and uh, then you can just put the compost on directly without cardboard but well, we're not, it's not that we're impatient, but we sort of expand our gardens bit by bit. And I'll just show you a few pictures and videos as I'm speaking here um, of some of the gardening spaces that we've basically set up over the years, the last three years when we bought the house, only three years ago. We've only gone, come through three growing seasons now, and we're going to keep expanding the gardens uh, bit by bit. And basically one corner at a time and it's ideal even doing a tenth of an acre at a time if even if you have over an acre don't worry about um, doing a full acre or anything like that just do small spaces like a twentieth or a tenth of an acre or even if you're in a suburb just do a corner of the garden first maybe a reasonable sized area like Mark Shepard would say it if you're going to have an ex do an experiment it's worth um, making sure that the experiment is big enough in case it's actually a success. So um, yeah, just just make a start really. And if you don't want to wait until the summer to smother the weeds with plastic, just put down a layer or two of cardboard. 
and uh, we'll get much more into that later on but uh, I don't want to keep these answers too long either um, we have um, uh, we're working on a video course at the moment as well um, of for on the topic of no dig mulch gardening of just what we've done we want to show people in detail what we've done it's just it'll take it's taken about uh, maybe six weeks to two months to even make the videos and then edit them takes a few weeks and uh, we'll um, of course it'll be a few hours worth of material so um, we'll, we'll, we'll let you all know when that's ready and uh, we'll offer it on our website then as well to watch or download and um, we'll get into more topics now um, we sorry into the next question uh, uh, Taryn asked um, my experience with uh, no digging is to first lay down a good layer of newspaper or cardboard in order to smother the weeds. Um, is that a necessary step? I believe I've asked, I've answered that question. I think it is necessary because weeds will come through. Um, if you just put down compost on top of the weeds, it is possible to smother them, but it would take an awful lot of compost. I mean, 20 centimeters or 8 inches worth and then put a bit of um, put put some uh, wood chips on top as an option that's the way Charles Dowding has done it uh, I would suggest at least putting down a, t a layer of comp one layer of uh, cardboard if it's lawn or if it's a field with very thick perennial grasses and weeds I would suggest um, don't mow it first it's a waste of time you're better off to actually smother it smother any weeds while they're fully attached to the plant and uh, there's no point in cutting them down first because they'll only sprout easier it's better to just basically throw the cardboard on top uh, of the existing grass on and weeds and um, we've even done that with uh, the likes of uh, thistles and nettles and uh, brambles even like blackberries I've just taken basically a full uh, a full two meter sheet of cardboard and just smothered them just by like basically flattening them and then we layered our um, compost on top but this we'd have to use very thick co uh, cardboard for that to for that to be effective and uh, a few bits and pieces might come true uh, like the perennial weeds that have a fair old taproot might come true a year or two later um, but what comes true is very easy to pull up it's just a little stringy sort of a, a white bit that comes up and um, let me see here uh, what's the better way uh, to use mulch um, I feel like uh, wood chips are put too much nitrogen into the soil actually I think um, the m most most difficult misconception is with when using wood chips is that um, wood chips take away take nitrogen away from the soil when they as they're decomposing but uh, our experience is and and many other no day gardeners like back to Eden gardeners especially Paul Gauchi um, their experience is that if you don't mix the layers uh, don't mix the mulch layer or the wood chip layer uh, with the soil or with the compost layer um, and then you're fine it'll only take a small bit of uh, nitrogen from the compost in order to decompose but it, wood chips are mostly woody there is a small bit of leaf and needles in them if the wood chips are fresh and that's called branch mulch um, that's the one you want to use for for the garden really the whole tree and mixed trees all together and uh, there isn't um, much nitrogen in the wood chips themselves so they wouldn't really add much to the soil but what it does add is of course carbon which uh, woody plants need to grow but also a ton of minerals we also like to amend our soils with a bit of volcanic rock dust as well though um, now let me see what's the next question where did we get our um, compost from? Right, the lorry load or the tractor load it's the same load actually 14 tons typically um, well 
you can get compost from uh, different places you can get uh, we found we found over the years that mushroom compost from mushroom factories or mushroom tunnels are is, that's the best material to use in the garden because it's sterile and it's safe uh, there is no fungicides in it certainly and uh, most of the time it's actually even steamed when it comes out of the factory at least uh, from the big factories so you don't get the mycelium of the button mushrooms or whatever ones they were growing there and um, you can uh, you can get it in large quantities for very little money but transport is typically speaking the issue the lorry load that you see on the picture I'll show it to you here um, that was quite expensive to transport how much was that uh, that was 300 euro uh, plus VAT to get that lorry tra to transport the material about an hour from a, from about an hour away but it's worth doing if it's if that's the only way you can do it but if you know somebody with a tractor uh, they can do it for half that cost so but first you need to find someone that's willing to do it because tractors are not designed to drive uh, 30 miles away or, or whatever distance you need uh, whatever distance your closest mushroom factory is uh, to you but uh, I'd suggest find one that's closest to you and then just use a car trailer to start with um, which does the job fine and you get a fair bit of material for as little as maybe 15 or 20 euro is all you want, want to give them really uh, for it but it's, it's worth a lot more than that of course and it's best to leave the compost for a month in a pile before you use it but you could lay, lay it down on the cardboard or on your uh, as a mulch layer on your uh, no dig beds um, straight away and then plant into it after a while um, it doesn't really need to take a lot of time but it does steam a fair bit it does decompose a, a good bit it would turn into a lovely black crumbly texture um, after a few months but it'll do that even if you have it laid down on the ground already so um, let's see all right let's get on to the next question uh, Stefania asked, uh, is it too late to get started now with a no-dig uh, garden bed or raised beds uh, for vegetables and flowers uh, for the upcoming growing season? Uh, she'd like to add uh, rotted or decomposed uh, grass clippings. Um, well, you can certainly use them, and it's, it's never too late to set up a lasagna uh, bed or even a raised bed, uh, depending on what kind of vegetables you'd like to grow. If the vegetables require a full growing season um, to r mature and ripen, well then you got to get those started early, maybe even in a greenhouse as plants, and then send, plant them out uh, after May, typically. Uh, when the frost, chance of frost is gone because a lot of um, the vegetables are actually frost tender but um, and a lot of them aren't as well so it depends on what you want to grow really uh, but it's it's only early yet this is only the end of January now so don't worry you have plenty of time yet to set up your garden I mean you have until April or even May uh, to get to really get uh, the garden beds ready um, you can use um, grass clippings as a compost as long as you decompose them properly. The problem is if you don't mix them with um, uh, some carbonous material, like 30 to 1 is usually the ratio. So uh, you need to mix them through with uh, some carbon material, like woody material, so that they get aerated properly. And you need to turn it sometimes as well. That's why making compost is quite a lot of work and um, sometimes not worthwhile depending on how much of it you need it's always good to make your own compost but we like to just um, basically put our kitchen waste into a hugel culture uh, bed or a mount bed and cover it with uh, compost or uh, with soil afterwards and um, with mulch or wood chips then and we'll just um, basically grow straight down into our compost pile essentially so um, um, yeah it depends your grass clippings as long as they're not anaerobic and if they smell bad it might be worthwhile to just um, um, add some um, small bits and pieces of branches or or any kind of a kind of woody garden waste 
uh, to them and just uh, give them a bit of air and just uh, sort of stir them up a little bit uh, every couple of weeks and um, I'd let them let them make sure that they're uh, fully rotted and for sort of turn into soil before you add them into your raised bed um, so the next question um, what's the best mulch to use uh, wood mulch or bark mulch or straw or hay and how deep well we've used uh, straw before it works fine the problem is straw can be um, risky because it actually can have fungicide in it and even herbicides so it can cause damage to your mycelium or your fungi in the soil and also to your plants as well uh, with the herbicides and especially the persistent ones um, if you can get stra straw that's fine but it doesn't really look great in the garden to be honest and you can't really walk on it properly it's better to use wood chips uh, bark mulch is good but it's expensive because a lot of people are using it as a decorative uh, material um, like uh, to basically mulch the garden for the same reason uh, that we do to make it look good but also to uh, stop weeds from growing um, but certainly not to grow vegetables in um, bark mulch is a material that is only uh, basically a waste material from the construction timber industry uh, from um, sawmills and uh, basically just uh, spruce and pine uh, bark uh, stripped off the trees before they process them for timber and it's not really a great material you don't want to use it if you can avoid it because it's expensive too go to your local um, tree services company that's where you can get uh, um, basically mixed wood chips or branch mulch and it's the whole tree uh, branches the the wood the branches the leaves the needles the whole thing the twigs all into it and uh, mix different types of trees as well together ideally if you can get it um, uh, pine trees or spruce is fine to use or even the landies there's no problem using it as a mulch uh, but it won't rot as quick as um, hardwoods in this case now hardwoods are actually um, uh, they will actually break down quicker because there is less uh, um, resin in them so uh, I hope that answers that question for you um, you see how deep as well ideally about uh, minimum two inches of, of mulch uh, when using wood chips uh, same as straw but four inches is sort of a good medium uh, a good median level uh, six inches if you have a lot of it and if you're not looking to do any maintenance for the next two years basically um, you have to sort of renew it a little bit so maybe put on an extra inch every year or two uh, after that as well if you're using wood chips with straw you'd nearly want to replace you'd want to nearly pile on an extra the same as uh, the same as what you put on originally uh, when you set up the garden you'd want to um, put on the same size same thickness a layer of straw again every year I would say um, I'll be careful with hay uh, there's a lot of uh, grass seeds in it so you don't really want to use hay for for that purpose at all and in a wet climate it can cause even other problems where it actually forms a layer and it gets like it's like sludge and it and it's anaerobic and it just holds the water uh, completely down and even on top there's nearly a puddle on top so it just it just turns into sludge and it's not much use it's not woody enough uh, not carbonous enough so straw can work hay i would definitely say no but uh, mixed wood chips or branch mulch is best um I see here that answers a couple of other questions here from other people too. Uh, let me see. Where would you find a large amount of wood chips? Your local tree services company or an uh, arborist, uh, basically. That's the best people to speak to. Ring around and ask them when I, and tell them whenever they have a load on the lorry or whenever they have a load on the trailer for the tractor to drop it up uh, to you and uh, that way they don't have to load it up and it'll you know it'll it'll help ease the workload on them and it might it might give you a better deal as well in the future um let me see here well, especially after a storm as well you have a lot of windfall and um, that's when tree services companies especially are busy 
course clearing the roads and all that and you'll see you, they'll be um, probably nearly struggling to get rid of all the wood chips but in the countryside they store them in their yard in a big pile and they sell them whenever people want them um, I, this is the way it is in Ireland I know in America especially in suburbia and in the cities they have to pay to get rid of them uh, have to bring them to the dump so obviously they, they would rather offload them at your land for free and you can offer that to them if if you're living um, in the city or in the suburb of a city but in the countryside nothing goes to waste especially here in Ireland so now next question let me see here um, what's a fair price for a lorry load of wood chips um, silage trailer or a lorry load um, that would be the biggest kind of load, maybe about 20 to 25 cubic meters, which is an awful amount of wood chips, or or even mulch. Um, I'd say about, it depends on how far they have to transport it. If they're local, the best price you'll get is about 150 or 200 euro uh, for that kind of size of load. And um, um, I would say if they have to drive it about a half an hour, um, it's probably going to be, or even an hour, if you're an hour away from them, it, they, they'll charge you about uh, three to four hundred euro for a load of wood chips. But it's still worth it because bark mulch is 900 euro uh, per lorry load, as I've inquired. And we almost ended up buying one until we found out from a neighbour here that um, actually a, a tree services company uh, is local to us here. So thank Christ because we got a few loads since and we certainly wouldn't be able to afford 900 euro per load of wood chips anyway so um yeah definitely just inquire and just find out where uh, where to where find out where you can get them as close to you as possible and uh, uh let me see here yeah no just and just um even if it takes an hour to transport them you, tractor trailers is usually uh the better way to do it but uh, lorries just cost 300 euro straight off the bat if you need an hour's transport and then they have to drive back as well. So, you know, it depends and it's still worth it, definitely worth getting them uh, because you're going to get a lot of benefits from them. The hours saved in not having to weed your garden f for years to come by getting one load of wood chips is just immeasurable. You can, um, you can basically, um, they, you can measure it even by um, how much uh, produce you're going to get out of it. I'd say that those wood chips are going to break down and they're going to add minerals and, and other nutrients and uh, of course carbon into the soil and uh, they will uh, greatly benefit your soil life and the insects will live in it as well. So you're, you're basically you're boosting, you're boosting the, um, the soil ecology in many ways by having the wood chip layer on top. But you can um, uh, you're, you're having the giving the habitat to the insects as well to live on your on your garden beds basically in the spaces between the wood chips really increases the nitrogen level as well in your soil because of the insects um, you know doing what they do and they also die there as well and they live there so um, it does actually have a positive impact in many ways so it's definitely worth doing and you're going to get thousands of euro worth of vegetables or fruit out of one load of wood chips so it's worth it in the long run it's like better than money having a better sorry better than having money in your bank account having a load of wood chips or a load of compost uh, on your land um let me see here like what else did you say here um uh, different types of wood chips i have already addressed that um, basically make sure if you can if you have a choice get mixed uh, wood chips the whole tree uh, including leaves and needles and branches and wood and uh, just um, all different types of trees okay. together mixed together uh, that's the best way to have it anyway now Rosie asks uh, with the wood chips, are slugs a problem? Uh, it seems to be a good hiding place for them. Um, there's also another slug related problem uh, question here, so I'm going to put that in at the same time. Um, 
Sabine asked uh, how to manage slugs, uh, the soil dwelling species, uh, from eating your tubers uh, in a no-dig area. Well, first of all, slugs are not as big a problem as people make it out, make them out to be. I understand that they are the main primary pest in cold temperate climates, especially maritime climates like here in Ireland and the UK. Um, you have um, uh, ants in the arid climates. That's basically they're the main uh, sort of recyclers, recyclers uh, in the drier climates, like around the equator. So um, here with the slugs, well, we've never struggled with slugs because we followed um, uh, our uh, basic steps: never leave dead plant matter around your uh, in your garden. Um, if you're using wood chips as a, a mulch, if you're not doing chop and drop, which is a different technique, which is more of a forest garden technique anyway, so you're not growing annual vegetables so much, but in your mulched garden where you have your wood chips, I would not leave dead plant matter there. And you can also help it by uh, preventing a lot of slug damage by s starting your plants as a seedling in the greenhouse and then planting it out uh, as a strong seedling in a, in a relatively large pot or from a tray as well, that's fine. But at least in the... Um, once you plant the seedling into your um, uh, mulched garden bed, the roots will actually root down very, very quickly because the soil is so malleable underneath. Uh, it's, uh, it's just very uh, loose soil because you're not digging the soil actually becomes uh, a lot more uh, uh, pa passable for the roots. It, it just uh, the roots just spread rapidly. We had a uh, good, really good results with like the courgettes. Even, jeez, we planted uh, a few courgette plants even three years ago in um, in a in a the horseshoe garden, as you'll find in our projects uh, uh, on our website. You'll find those different small little gardens uh, there, and you can see. How quickly things took off as well. There's pictures, uh, galleries of pictures with um, how many weeks into planting it is or after planting. And uh, we've had courgette plants that had roots that were basically spreading about a square meter after only three or four weeks, uh, which is absolutely amazing results. Uh, and of course, then you get a big harvest uh, very quickly. Um, basically, your plants can outgrow the slug pressure. That's the way you have to look at it. If your plants are healthy, the slugs will be less likely to damage them or to go, to go near them. Slugs are the recyclers of the cold temperate climates. So you need to keep in mind that the, they are there. their job is basically to uh, eat any, any plants that are struggling or that are stressed, that are sending out stress signals um, um, and basically saying, um, just come in and just get rid of me um, one little thing that really opened our eyes was that uh, i had lettuce growing on one side of the garden just here and during the day i knocked off just knocked down uh, like i pulled out a um, thistle plant um, just beside the lettuce and i left it there on the ground and at night time i came out to do the out to the garden to empty the compost bin and uh, i saw about 15 or 20 slugs all over the thistle, eating the thistle, but they were not on the lettuce right there. The lettuce was spotless. Absolutely amazing eye opener. I wish I had taken a picture of it at the time. Um, yeah, so uh, we have an article on our website about slugs as well, how to prevent slug damage. Um, it might be worth having a look at. It's just um, basically maybe 10 just. Um, uh, lines on the topic really but uh, yeah I know about um, the slugs eating the tubers the slugs are not a problem uh, in that um, the tubers are uh, under the wood chips and the slugs don't like to go across the wood chips especially in the summer because they're kind of dry and somewhat sharp as well so the surface of the wood chips is always uh, dry it dries out very quickly and um, they also hold water like a sponge underneath though at the same time so they're just the perfect medium um yeah so i i guess just don't give the slugs a habitat and just don't invite them in 
by leaving dead plant matter around. So, um, let me see here the next question. Uh, what's the best way to deal with compacted soil in a no-dig garden? Um, let me see here. Yeah, compacted soil, there's only a very few things you can do. Either you add organic matter, um, and it's the same thing as waterlogged soil. I see uh, Melanie asked here um, what to do with uh, uneven and waterlogged areas. Well, compacted soil means that it is waterlogged, most likely, and it's, that means there's anaerobic conditions, and that's not good for the plants because the roots can't absorb the water uh, or the minerals as well because the only way a plant can actually absorb water and minerals is through osmosis and that is in a gas form which is um, why if you take a plant and you put it into a bucket of water it's going to suffocate and die. It has to have a nice aerated soil so that uh, air can get in and out. The soil has to breed. Um, how do you, how do you uh, fix compacted soil? Well that's a good question. There's different ways you can do that. Either you can, um, if you're looking to do a cover crop, you can do um, radish, especially daikon radish is one that people use. Um, you could, uh, but this all requires tilling though really. Um, if you're not going to till, you don't really have a cover crop. Um, you could cover the ground in plastic and smother the weeds, then put on a bit of compost, just a thin layer of compost, maybe an inch, and then put um, some put down some cover crop seeds. Uh, anything tap rooted, tap rooted plants are really good at breaking up the soil. Um, we even use dandelions to break up the soil. Believe it or not, that's that's what nature does. If there is a compacted piece of ground, uh, especially if it's waste ground, um, it just sends in the thistles and the great mullins and uh, dandelions and all of the tap rooted plants. Uh, radishes are really good at that, uh, carrots too, but they're not as hardy as uh, radish. Um, and all of these plants are beneficial in some way. You can just chop them down and then they'll turn into mulch uh, or even turn into compost on top uh, after you're done with them. But um, you can also add more. If you don't want to do cover crop, you can simply add some uh, uh, as much organic matter as, as you can get your hands on, really. Um, basically... Just do the lasagna bed on top and just leave the ground be underneath and the worms will come up in and, and they will come up through the cardboard. After the cardboard is gone, after a few months, they will the worms will actually make channels up and down to, into the uh, fr from the native soil underneath into the uh, actual compost and it they will take some of that fertility down as well and they'll mix it through. Uh, all, all without you having to do anything. Nature will take care of it. Uh, but adding organic matter is the way to go with water off soil. Um, and that's all you can do. And I would suggest adding both uh, compost and wood chips on top as well. Um, let me see. Another question. Hang on. I'm going to do a cut. Now, what else did you say, Robert? Um, you'd like to know... Um, What's the best procedure to prepare a seed bed? That depends on what you mean by a seed bed. Do you mean like um, a, a place where you want to grow uh, vegetables, for example, like carrots, where you want to direct seed them? Well, the best thing to do is just brush the wood chips away in a little uh, kind of a channel, just a little trench, and then put your, even, even add in a few hands full of compost just to bring up the level a little bit, just on that little bit. Uh, just in that one in within the trench itself then add your seeds on top and then as the little seedlings grow uh, You just close the wood chips in From both sides. It's always best to take the wood chips like this and brush them off to both sides using a rake That's the best way I found um, But most of our stuff is directly uh, is not direct so it's always um, planted in a greenhouse first to get it established first uh, and uh, at least you can see what you have and you can just plant it out then directly into wherever you want it uh, you can um, you can even do carrot you can transplant carrots it's it's possible and it's not a big deal really a lot of people say you, you shouldn't do it and I understand that because taproot plants 
you know, you want them to establish their taproot. Even carrots could be two meters long, but you don't know because the, the, the root usually is only thick up to about that depth. But it's a hair thin fecking root. Um, it actually still gathers some nutrients underneath way down in the soil. But it doesn't really matter. It'll still do fine anyway. Uh, if you transplant it into a, a lasagna bed. Um, how do how do you prevent uh, tubers such as potatoes and Jerusalem artichokes from taking over uh, within or without digging them all up? Uh, good question. It is possible to dig up all of the uh, tubers. Um, the potatoes and the okas, uh, I found they they struggle to come back if you don't have if you have an active soil life. And if you don't dig them all up, they actually get eaten once the soil life uh, starts waking up in springtime, maybe around April. Uh, so that's why we dig them out and we actually start them off in in, in trays or in, uh, in pots in the greenhouse. And then we plant them out again about a month or two later, depending on what type of tubers they are. Um, we found with potatoes... Yeah, no, potatoes also, they get eaten by the soil life. Um, Jerusalem artichokes are, are very sure, This vigorous. whole patch of ground now, I would suggest there is more in a permanent we, we spot. Even, there's more but tubers if you're than in the soil, in a raised bed, and we find example, it quite hard. Uh, there's a big one. It's not a problem, really. We you find can, it quite hard to um, and if they start, if you see cover all the tubers up, with soil the plant, when they get exposed. Uh, as you see, as there you is see is I don't think it's a big issue. But we plant them we in our lasagna beds permanently. Sometimes bring in uh, a bit of in the forest chips garden as well. Just to we throw on top. In the corners of the forest garden. There is more. And you can just try well, and keep them separate so that you know where they are. That's probably just about one plant there. Uh, we dig them up along the paths and uh, when we need them. And we just leave them all uh, in the middle of the bed. We leave them so that they keep growing outwards, sort of. Uh, we love using Jerusalem artichokes as, as fencing or as um, sort of shelter belt plants uh, for the summer. Um, makes for lovely little uh, cozy areas. Uh, let me see here. Have you tried growing mushrooms in your mulch? Yes, you have. we have. Um, not yet successful. We don't know if the mycelium has taken. Um, Chances are we do have so many mushrooms growing on our land, but all of them not the ones we planted. Um, there's lots of wild mushrooms growing with the uh, mulch that we've put down, maybe 10 different varieties. We don't even know what they are. Obviously, we wouldn't eat them because we're not experts on mushrooms. But we're trying to grow a wine cap mushroom or um, King Strafaria. I would suggest trying that one. Uh, try growing that one. It's also known as Garden Giant. I'll show you a picture of it. Um, it's uh, it's the easiest one to grow, and we're going to try and grow it again year after year now. Uh, last year in the new garden, uh, we planted it in about five different places, and um, hopefully it will be a success. We have taken videos, and we must uh, compile those, and we'll see if we have some popping up. We have spotted that the mycelium, the white strands, um, have actually they're there where we planted them it's just that it can take a year or two for the um, fungi to establish or the mycelium itself to establish until it actually starts fruiting so remember the mushrooms are just the fruiting body of the fungi so and the mycelium is like the root underneath the soil which is what connects all the plants as well and um, the Strafari King Strafaria actually benefits uh, plants as well. It is, it is a symbiotic um, uh, mushroom that helps uh, to gather minerals and water. It extends the plants, uh, the roots of the plants, in exchange for sugar. Um, we have grown logs. We're going to do a workshop on mushroom logs at some point soon. Uh, we haven't done it successfully yet with um, lion's mane or with... Uh, shiitake mushrooms but we have done um, we have an article on our website actually as well about mushroom logs and how to do it just a little picture gallery there too um, we have uh, grown turkey tail successfully the logs actually dried out all of the logs dried out in the forest um, uh, which is really unfortunate uh, that's why they didn't grow but the turkey tails took 
and uh, I'll show you a picture of those here now. That's a great medicinal mushroom. It's a bit like echinacea. It boosts the immune system when you need it. Um, let me see here. Yeah, there are some great, uh, great videos on uh, YouTube of uh, how to grow King Strafaria. Um, Paul Stamets recommends to grow the um, King Strafaria or the wine cap mushroom um, by getting some cardboard and tearing off one side of it so that you have the sort of the wavy bit on top. You wet it down, you put down the spawn, which is just the sawdust with all the white strands in it. And then you can put down a bit of uh, your either your fresh wood chips. Uh, always remember that uh, when you're growing uh, mushrooms, you have to use wood that's less than one month old. Uh, like uh, otherwise, other mushrooms will have already populated it. Ideally, very fresh wood. Uh, wood chips, very fresh, and uh, logs also very fresh, as fresh as possible, really. But definitely no long, no older than one month. Otherwise, you're uh, cultivated varieties uh, of culinary and medicinal mushrooms will not take, uh, most likely anyway. Next question. Uh, garden is uneven. Uh, the, it is waterlogged. Um, I've already answered that earlier. Um, what's the best way to deal with that in a no-dig way? Is it necessary to have some uh, borders for raised beds? in the Nordic areas. Now I would suggest using, you don't have to use wood to border off, make the traditional raised beds unless you're going to raise beds or design raised beds high enough so you don't have to bend down for to get at your produce if you have a problem with your back or whatever. But in general um, that's one of, that actually addresses one of the other questions that uh, Dara um, has uh, has asked here uh, what are the advantages of no dig uh, versus raised beds and what are the limitations of no dig well one limitation of no dig is that you have to bend down uh, you could do raised beds with no dig as well but I prefer not to because you're only you're only uh, creating an artificial environment once you're using things like uh, wood or even a greenhouse or that kind of thing if you're creating a raised bed with uh, wooden sides for example that wood is going to require maintenance. It might actually uh, dissolve or, or, or it might actually no, be no longer of use after a few years as well. So you're going to have to replace um, the, the contents or the soil within that raised bed after some years of growing anyway. You can still amend with liquid feed as well. Uh, you can make your own liquid compost um, or liquid plant feed by using nettles or comfrey and just put it in the barrel basically uh, add water and uh, rainwater and um, leave it for a week stir it sometimes and then you can uh, sieve it and then use it with a, with a watering can that way you don't ever have to actually um, replace the soil in your raised beds um, I would also suggest uh, adding a mineral um, amendment um, which is actually another thing that Dara addressed here. Uh, he was asking, should I fertilize the compost uh, before uh, putting it down or before planting your plants? I would suggest there is no need to fertilize compost because the compost is actually the plant food. Um, you can add certain things that are not in the compost yet. The compost usually has a lot of nitrogen in it, which is animal manures. But you, your wood layer on top, the mulch itself, will add the carbon to the soil. And that's the two main things that plants really need, along with a bunch of other minerals. You can add, um, amend the soil at all times with a bit of volcanic rock dust, just a sprinkle on top of your bed and water it in. And the rain will water, in, water it in some more then over time as well. And it will make an awful difference to your plants because plants, and the same as us and all animals, are made of minerals. We're like 90% water and 10% minerals, basically. Um, healthy plants uh, need minerals. Um, I wouldn't bother with uh, artificial borders in your garden. Um, Melanie, I would suggest uh, to simply um, use 
whatever you have for example field stones or rocks that's what we use here and it makes a nice um, it makes for a nice natural looking border and also the stones themselves actually hold the heat during the day uh, when the sun shines on them and they let it off uh, in the evening time when it gets colder that gives a little bit of a ambient microclimate to the plants that are planted next to the rocks or next to the the border we just um, also you can use uh, plastic under the rocks or even under whatever material you're using to block the grass roots from coming up as well um, I hope that answers that question um, let me see here oh yes uh, one thing I didn't address there was that the garden the soil the ground is uneven well what you can do is you can just even it out a little bit using um, compost and then um, I wouldn't bother like if, if there's big rocks in it to so just remove the rocks if they're if they're in the way if you can't walk on them like you don't want to break your ankle but just um, I wouldn't be digging up all of the rocks trying to make it all perfectly flat it's important to have a bit of texture in your uh, garden and uh, I just covered in mulch and that's what's going to give you a surface to walk on and it's also going to help with your water log issues as well of your soil um, I hope it's not getting too dark at this stage now it's actually we're coming up to a half tree here now and it's a cloudy day um, I don't want to turn on the light though because it's going to change the, the lighting conditions of the camera completely uh, hopefully we we'll get through these now don't want to keep you for too long um, Do we till the soil before no, not digging? Uh, we do not dig the soil. Uh, we don't till it at all. Uh, some people till it the first time and then they go no dig after that because they want to amend the soil and get rid of the weeds and grasses. You can do that. Michael Pilarski on YouTube has some really good materials on uh, planting a food forest, a medicinal food forest, and uh, that's the way he does it. Uh, he's really good at it now. He's an expert at growing medicinal and uh, plants and, and food as well. Um, stones, yeah, no, if, if, if I wouldn't bother, just take up, uh, Carol, um, you, as for your question, I would suggest, uh, simply take, take away all of the big stones and then just even out the, the ground using, uh, compost and then you can put the cardboard on there. That's what the way they do it in Australia. Um, Bill Mollison always, and Jeff Lawton. I always used to put down the compost layer first and then the cardboard and then whatever wood chip or, or straw on top. You can do it that way, but we like to put uh, on reasonably level ground, we like to put the cardboard down first in order to smother the weeds and then the, and then the compost so that we can plant into the bed straight away. We don't have to wait until the cardboard dissolves, but we also don't want to make holes in the cardboard as well. So... Um, that's really important. I, I wouldn't make any holes in the cardboard. If you have a tree to plant, plant the tree first and then put the cardboard around it, sort of like, just all around it. Um, let me see here, what else? Do we have, uh, Carol also asked, uh, do you have any water logging issues along the edges of the polytunnel? Uh, we don't. I'm not sure whether you mean the inside or the outside. Uh, on the inside we don't we don't have any crops we just water what's on the tables and just bone dry so that slugs don't have any interest in coming in and that's really important to us because that's where the small little vulnerable plants are being uh, raised from seed um, so not really no uh, we don't water inside the polytunnel um, on the outside where the trenches are dug uh, we don't mind if there's water in the trenches themselves where the plastic is and and uh, which were would have been filled up with soil um, because that adds extra weight holding down the plastic in a windy uh, in windy conditions so not a bad thing I'll do a cut here Maria asked uh, what varieties of corn uh, do we grow well actually this last year we were very late to start corn we just hadn't thought of it because we were starting so many other plants um, corn uh, we planted very late so we decided to go with a, nor a Scottish variety called Northern Extra Sweet um, so it seems like a good variety the cobs are a little small as you'll see here I'll show you a cob here in the video um, 
the plants are quite um, small as well they're only about uh, five foot tall uh, but it's still a great it's a great corn I think and uh, once we plant them in the ground earlier next year I think they'll do even better they weren't particularly sweet simply because a lot of them didn't uh, ripen uh, because we planted them too late only in June we planted a lot of them in the ground so but uh, I would suggest if you're struggling for sunlight or if you're in a place where you have a limited uh, length of growing season you should definitely consider a varieties that that are not very big in the cobs and very sweet. I would suggest going for northern varieties such as northern extra sweet from Scotland. There are, I'm sure there is other ones as well from Scandinavia that require even a shorter growing season. But in Ireland and in the UK you shouldn't have a problem growing any corn as long as you start them off early enough. Don't think it really needs to be a good summer to get it, but I would suggest growing more than one variety of corn, anyway, of everything. Always grow two or three varieties of all of the vegetables and fruits. Just you never know what way the, the, the summer is going to go. Or here in Ireland, as we like to say, whether or not there's going to be any summer at all. Uh, but that's more of a joke, really. I think the last few years now we've had fairly good summers. Um, some droughts as well which is very unusual now for Ireland especially but um, wouldn't mind another heat wave unless you know it depends um, always depends on what you're growing in the garden I mean um, uh, Ben Falk from Vermont in America always used to say he, he wrote a book called The Resilient Homestead and he says that it's best to grow plants that are about two uh, two zones up and down from your zone um, so an, a range of uh, climate zones basically so that if the weather gets colder in general your plants you're gonna have some plants that will grow fine and if it gets hotter you know it will um, it, there'll be other ones that will pick up uh, that will be more productive then. Mm, what other questions do I have Uh, Dara also asked here, I have a beech tree, I have beech trees near um, where I'm growing vegetables. Uh, when the leaves fall, uh, will it be likely, or they'll, they'll be likely to cover the bark mulch or the, the actual, the wood chip mulch. Uh, can I just leave them there? Um, yes, you can. And leaves make for a great mulch material. Uh, they're just not very woody, so you can't really walk on them as well They're, I mean the the wood chips make for a great uh, all around material like that for paths and for garden spaces as well but you'll find that the, the we have trees nearby uh, some of our uh, no dig mulch gardens as well and there is no problem with leaves falling on top of them they just, they'll dissolve after the winter anyway so I wouldn't worry about that too much and they'll add they'll, you know, they'll, they'll add to the soil soil's fertility as well long term and think about sure uh, forest floor that's how it uh, that's how the forest feeds itself that's how it insulates the soil life and its roots from uh, the winter uh, the cold winter temperatures and in the springtime then all of those uh, um, uh, leaves will have broken down by the mycelium or by the fungi and by the soil life and turn into plant available uh, um, nutrients for the trees to eat up and uh, make new leaves basically so and so the cycle continues all right well that's all there is to it for now thanks for watching and um hopefully it wasn't too long of a video for you guys um and hopefully it's um uh, somewhat conclusive and it'll help you um, start your own gardens if you haven't got one or you can always uh amend what garden space you've already got i mean you wouldn't believe how productive a small little garden can be even if it's only a 20th of an acre or just a, f a few little uh, garden beds um, eight by four beds or raised beds if you like if you can bend down that's completely understandable that you want to do raised beds and that's a good way to do it too um, depending on your circumstances uh, we like to um, put down our garden beds uh, in a permanent way 
So we like to grow perennial plants um, as much as we can, so we don't have to replant them. But we keep some spaces in between the perennial plants so that we can grow some annual plants uh, there as well, such as things like vegetables or whatever, any anything really that um, requires a little more maintenance. We like to um, uh, keep them in the uh, between the uh, perennials and we like to um, have things that we use on a daily basis like the culinary herbs for example for cooking uh, near the borders of our garden beds and things like rhubarb or things that you only harvest once a year like fruits or fruit bushes or or even apples or plums or pears just put them somewhere in the back where you don't need to harvest them all the time um, all right thanks for watching and um, see you at the next one bye bye